morning, actually. Sorry about that. Good morning. Uh, time now, 11 a.m. Uh, in uh, uh, Tokyo, December the 2nd to Friday, 2022. Uh, welcome uh, back to another edition uh, of the uh, World Bank uh, uh, online seminar organized by the World Bank uh, Tokyo office team. Um, today, we have actually a special uh, seminar featuring uh, Dr. Will Martin, who is a senior research fellow from International uh, Food Policy Research Institute, which is part of CGIAR. Um, uh, um, Will uh, is now uh, in Japan, uh, partly participating in an international conference organized yesterday in Niigata, and also give a couple of talks uh, in Tokyo area today. So it's a very uh, quick visit for him uh, to uh, come to Japan. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, this seminar was made possible uh, uh, with a special thanks to uh, Professor Masahiro Kawai and uh, Irina, uh, who actually uh, invited uh, uh, Will uh, all the way from Washington uh, to come to Japan. And uh, we were extremely happy to be able to grab uh, his uh, precious uh, time uh, in, uh, in Tokyo today. Uh, we are going to listen to uh, him uh, presenting uh, the latest uh, research uh, result uh, around the uh, issues uh, related to uh, the uh, healthy diet uh, and uh, uh, the food price uh, changes uh, and also uh, uh, countries' uh, income level uh, from the low, middle, and high incomes. And then uh, his, uh, his latest uh, uh, a speech titled uh, Consumer Demand for Healthy Diet Modeling the Impact of the Food Access on Consumption. We'll listen to him uh, you know, presenting on this topic for another uh, uh, 35, 40 minutes. Then um, we will, uh, you know, uh, re uh, I'll read a question that we received uh, in advance from the viewers. And also, uh, you are more than welcome to uh, submit your questions either by online form uh, posted on the announcement page of this seminar or uh, post your uh, question on the chat section. So I'll read your question asking Will to uh, respond. Uh, with that, I'd like to ask uh, Will to come in to start his presentation. And I would like to ask him to also briefly talk about what uh, CGIR and what IFPRI does uh, for the benefit of uh, those who are not so much familiar with IFPRI itself. So Will, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Koichi, for that very kind uh, introduction. Um, I, um, as, as Koichi mentioned, I'd be happy to chat a little at first about the, the, the CGIAR system. The CGIAR system, um, uh, now known as One CGIAR, um, encompasses a range of research institutes. Some of the most famous are the International Rice Research Institute, in Los Banos, the Philippines, um, CIMIT, the International Center for Maize and Wheat Research, um, headquartered in Mexico, um, the International uh, Institute for Tropical Agriculture in Baden. Um, there's a range of centers focused on improving, mainly focused on improving the productivity uh, of crops and livestock, the International Livestock Research Institute uh, in Nairobi, for instance. Um, but it was recognized when that system was established, it was a little incomplete, you know, when it was set up in the late 60s, early 70s, in that it didn't encompass um, an institute that looked at food policy. And the International Food Policy Research Institute, headquartered in Washington, D.C., um, was established in 1976 um, to fill that gap. And what we work on at the International Food Policy Research, at IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, um, is a whole range of policy issues related to food policy, um, you know, pricing policy, uh, the um, uh, food and nutrition is a very important aspect uh, of our work. This is a new area for me, um, but I'm working with my colleague, Will Masters, at, uh, from Tufts University, who is a, a very, very uh, well established in, in this field. Um, and the question we're asking in this paper is how best to influence um, 
consumer demand for food. Um, so what we're doing is modeling the impact of, of food access uh, on consumption. Um, now, this work is part of a project led by uh, Will Masters and Derek Hetty um, called the Food Prices for Nutrition Project. Um, and it tries to measure food access. So what determines access to food? It's driven by income and other uh, financial resources, household earnings and safety net transfers being the key there, and the prices of available food items. Actual consumption of food, though, is driven by other factors, individual time use and preferences, food culture and aspirations. Any visitor to Japan is well aware um, that the food culture of Japan um, is quite different from the food culture, say, um, of the uh, American Midwest. Um, so, um, and then, of course, there are preferences for animal-sourced food. In richer countries, people eat a great deal more of animal-sourced foods than people in poorer countries. And as we'll see, in fact, um, as incomes rise, that pattern of consumption overshoots uh, towards too much animal-sourced food rather than too little, as in poor countries. So what does this paper do? We begin to explore how improved access to food might affect actual consumption. A food improved access could come from lower prices for healthy items, higher incomes from employment, safety nets, nutrition assistance. But Normally, we tend to think, as economists, we tend to think, well, as incomes grow up, grow, uh, people have more choices. They're better able to meet their desires. Um, but in the case of nutrition, things are slightly different. People can't see, taste, or smell the healthiness of food or the healthiness of their diet. So a key question is what drives their food choices? Now, one obvious thing is the income, what the economists call the income elasticity uh, for, for food. As your income rises, you, you uh, like to purchase more food and, and different food. Food choices move away from starchy staples, which the poorest are forced to consume alone, pretty much alone with little variety because they don't have enough income. But income elasticities for some food items, uh, like um, animal source foods, tend to be very high uh, amongst poor people. Another factor is that the price elasticity of demand for healthy foods may be low. So there may be little impact of availability and price on, um, on food choice. So what do we need? We need estimates of changes in consumption as incomes rise and prices change. Um, so key question is, will access to healthy foods raise diet quality? There's a big literature out there um, uh, using diverse metrics for diet quality and food access. Mostly location-specific studies, conditional on a, on a particular context. Um, you know, a lot of work done, for instance, on uh, home gardens. Do, do households that have their own garden produce their own food? Do they eat better than those who buy food in the market? But much of this research is about specific aspects of diet quality or food access, not about the very the big picture that we're, we're interested in this work. Now, one thing I found very frustrating when I started to work on this nutrition food prices for nutrition, is we didn't seem to have a good quality index. We didn't seem to have something like what economists talk about, a utility function, something that will tell you whether you've achieved, whether your diet is high quality in terms of health um, or whether and, and nutrition, or whether it's low quality. Um, what we're also looking at is we're looking at food access measured through market prices and household income. And then we're looking 
at what we want is a situation where preferences are measured in a consistent way for all the world's people. We know diets are very diverse, but when you look at the content, the nutritional content of those diets, as we'll see, they're rather uh, less diverse um, than you might expect. So what do we use for this analysis? We're using a, a complete demand system for all foods, healthy and unhealthy. It's a study, uh, an approach developed um, to study the dietary transition uh, between food groups, uh, an approach uh, developed by Christophe Kuehl and Hussein Guimard and published in the American Journal of Agricultural Economics in 2018. Um, what it uses is a, a global average preference for all people, looks across, in cross-section around 20, 20, 2010, um, and looks at derived demand for the traded farm commodities as a way of glo guiding global agriculture. What, where is demand going? Where, what, uh, what, what foods are going to be demanded? As we know very well that... Um, for poor people, the income elasticities of food are some, sometimes quite high. For richer people, they tend to be much lower. Um, the, the demand for uh, staple foods, starchy staples like rice uh, or millet, um, tends to be have very little income elasticity. That as incomes rise, people's consumption patterns um, move to other products, especially animal source foods. So the approach we use, we use a flexible representation of the effects of income growth on diets to capture that nutritional transition. Um, we use what's called a healthy diet basket index to quantify the nutritional consequences of diet. This is like a production function for health. Uh, for economists, as translating from nutrition to economists, is like a production function for health. We look at dietary patterns at different points on the global distribution of income. And then finally, we examine the changes, what changes in food prices would be needed to improve diet quality at different levels of income. So representing the nutritional transition we use an approach called the MADADS model, um, <clears throat> and uh, it's due to Paul Preckel, Bob Cranfield, and Thomas Hotel in 2010. It's designed to represent food demand with non-linearities at the lower and the upper bounds of that uh, uh, income level. And we use that to model how changes in income alter composition of healthy diet basket foods. It includes price effects uh, as well, although that's something of a lesser focus uh, in this study. In so when we look as per capita incomes rise, say from $500 um, in 2010 US dollars up to 50, 60, 70,000 US dollars, we see some big changes in consumption patterns. You look at the, the pale blue area at the bottom, starchy staples. Very, very poor people, even their consumption of starchy staples is somewhat constrained. And so you'll see up to an income level of about $5,000 per capita, 2010 US dollars, um, there's a small rise in consumption level after that we see consumption of starchy staples begin to actually decline. When the diets are constrained by the size of the human digestive system, we don't continue to eat more and more of the same foods at all. And as you can see, starchy staples consumption has fallen. Now, we've seen this very dramatically in the last uh, 80 years uh, in Japan, where rice consumption uh, has actually fallen. Um, and we see it very strongly. We saw it strongly in urban China at an earlier period. And we're now seeing it uh, in rural China as well. That actual decline in the consumption, per capita consumption of, sta of starchy staples. Sweeteners, sugar, not very good for us. Um, 
its consumption rises, but not, not very rapidly um, as consumption, uh, as incomes rise. Uh, but rich people eat too much of sweeteners um, to be good for them. Um, vegetables, is our pulses, nuts and seeds. Uh, talk to any nutritionist and they will say, these are extremely good for you. Um, what we find is there's almost no response of consumption of pulses, nuts and seeds to income. So if, as people get richer, uh, their consumption stays more or less, um, uh, more or less the same. I should mention all of these are, are measured uh, in kilocalories per person per day, and this is designed to deal with the fact that each of these groups of food looks quite different in different countries. So starchy staples, traditionally in much of East Asia, has been primarily uh, rice. Um, although at very low levels of income, you see quite a lot um, of uh, millet um, and other coarser and maize, coarser grains uh, in the consumption pattern. Um, now, in many parts of the developing world, wheat, especially, say, in the Middle East, wheat is the dominant starchy staple. Um, <clears throat> and then in parts of Africa, you have uh, a lot of, Maize as a starch, as a dominant staple, uh, but but also cassava, the root crops, um, and in countries like Uganda, uh, plantains as a major source of starchy staples. Um, so in <clears throat> uh, sweeteners, the composition of that mostly uh, is is driven by sugar. Uh, pulses, nuts, and seeds again highly diverse. In some countries like India, Rwanda, a lot of consumption. Uh, of, of beans as a source of protein. Vegetables and fruits, you do see some expansion in consumption as incomes rise, but not, but not very much. Um, and oils and fats, here's a, here's a challenge nutritionally. Oils and fats consumption rises quite dramatically as incomes rise. We all know... Um, that salt, sugar, and fat are very appealing, um, and we all have a bit of a sense that they're not really very good for us, but um, that's certainly a feature of the dietary transition, that big increase in the consumption of oils and fats. And then when we come at the top, the animal source foods, meats and seafood, very big increases in consumption of calories from those. Um, dairy and eggs, uh, also sizable increases uh, in consumption. We can see uh, that consumption levels end up, uh, calories end up rather high, um, at, at uh, high income levels above 50,000, uh, consumption levels of, in terms of overall calories in the order of 3,000. That's, that's part of the reason that we have such challenges with obesity um, in so many high-income countries. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, these are predictions from the demand system estimated by Guo and Gwimba. These are actually very, very light. I don't think anyone's going to be terribly surprised by these predictions, but it's very important to have a way uh, of <clears throat> laying them out. Um, great. So, whoops. Oh, there we go. So, what do we need? We need some sort of measure of diet quality. If we're, if we're trying to analyze the impacts of, of interventions, we really want to know whether an intervention improves nutritional outcomes, um, <clears throat> and if so, by how much. We want something rather like the, the utility and social welfare functions that economists use uh, when they're trying to... Uh, model and represent the impacts of interventions on other ch demand consumption choices. Uh, we want to know whether a, an intervention is going to improve outcomes or not. Um, what we end up using here is a, a food-based dietary guideline for 10 different countries. Um, these are uh, 
set out in a study by Herfurth and et al. 2022, very recent study. It's a background paper for the state of food insecurity in the world. Um, the 10 countries are chosen to be quite diverse um, and they're also influenced, the choice is influenced by the availability of high quality dietary guidelines. So the countries, Argentina, Benin, China, India, Jamaica, Malta, Netherlands, Oman, the US, and Vietnam. Um, the dietary guidelines, what we're looking at is not so much the level of food consumption, but the, sh the, the composition of that. So we, we look at that, what's the, the total calories for a diet for someone who's consuming 2,330 calories. So that's recommended level for um, uh, mature uh, female. Um, there are many different guidelines on the, on the quantity. Um, but an interesting feature is that the dietary guidelines provided by uh, national uh, dietary guidelines in different countries uh, turn out to be surprisingly similar. They suggest that starchy staples should be about a half of dietary energy. Um, <clears throat> Protein-rich foods should be about a quarter. Vegetables and fruit, about 10 to 15% of dietary uh, calorie consumption. So that gives us a basis for healthy diet targets. The deviations from those guidelines implying lower quality diets. And here's a, a, a chart from the Herfurth et al. paper. Uh, if you look at, say, Argentina's dietary guidelines and uh, recommendations, these are not what people actually consume. These are what nutritionists uh, feel people should consume. Um, the, the dark blue, the starchy staples commodity, a little under half. You go to Benin, the recommendation is slightly above a half. That's a country where income levels are very low um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the dietary guidelines are suggesting a, a little more food should come from starchy staples, partly because a lot of people have less access to, starchy, uh, to, to other foods because of the costs. Um, China, a little more, again, food recommended to come from starchy staples. But by and large, the, the share of food consumption from starchy staples is generally around a half. Um, <clears throat> when we move to the other components, animal source foods, uh, fruits, vegetables, um, we see quite a lot uh, of, of relative heterogeneity. Um, but what we end up settling on um, is a, a composition, more or less an average from those 10 countries, where roughly half of food consumption comes from starchy staples, half of the calories that you consume. About 300 out of 2,300 come from pulses and nuts, 270 from vegetables and fruit, 300 from oils and fats, and so on. Meat and seafood, 157. Dairy and egg, 143. Much lower um, numbers than we see in diets in many rich countries. So to turn this into an index, um, what we do is to calculate those calories as a share of the total, 2330 calories, and compare those uh, actual consumption patterns, QI, with the shares in the target diet, the shares associated with the target diet, they're specified uh, in the table. And the healthy diet basket index um, is if we consider cases where um, uh, the, the cons a product is under consumed, where TI minus QI is greater than zero, then we calculate the healthy diet basket index by uh, subtracting the sum of those shortfalls from one. Alternatively, we may measure the cases where um, the, the consumption is above the target level. Um, these give you the same results because of the way the index uh, is structured. So how to interpret it? Um, the, I've just got the formula there again. So a diet matching the recommended diet has an index value of one. So if you look at the healthy diet basket index, 
if QI, the actual consumption, equals TI in all cases, then the summation sign equals zero. A diet matching the recommended diet has an index value of one. A decimal diet includes only one small nutrient category. So a heavily unbalanced diet consisting only of dairy and eggs would have a healthy diet basket index of about 0.6. So all of the QIs um, uh, other than uh, <clears throat> uh, other than uh, uh, dairy and eggs um, uh, are, are zero, and we end up with a, a dietary index of 0.6. So that's a, a very unbalanced diet, has a very small value, a diet matching the recommended diet index has an index value of one. As nutrient I, as consumption rises to the target, uh, you have a linear increase in the quality of the diet until you reach the target whereupon that, um, that product contributes to a decline uh, in the index because you, you're losing something else. So what, what do we see? If we focus on shortfalls below the healthy diet basket uh, index, um, what we see if you, if you look at the very low income levels, and these are um, in $22, what you see is animal source foods. Very poor people don't have access to animal source foods. They have to rely almost exclusively um, on uh, cereals, on the uh, starchy staples for their, for their consumption uh, patterns. Um, <clears throat> and so that they have inadequate consumption um, of vegetables and fruit and of pulses um, and, 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 and so on. Now, what, as incomes rise, um, consumption of animal source foods actually uh, increases. The shortfall uh, in the diet d disappears for animal source foods and for oils and fats. And then you, you get to a situation at about an income level of 15,000 um, in today's dollars, where, or somewhere between rather 7,000 and 15,000, more or less the upper middle income level in the World Bank measures, um, the diet reaches its best uh, quality uh, level. You have very small uh, shortfalls. Then, as incomes rise further, um, you end up with shortfalls in uh, cereal consumption. As people move away from starchy staples, they end up eating too little cereals, too little starchy sta staple foods. Um, at all levels, we see people consuming too little by way of vegetables and fruit. Um, and uh, we see um, underconsumption. Uh, of pulses uh, right right throughout the consumption level. I personally um, get some advice from a nutritionist and she continually reminds me of this. You, know, you really need to cut back on consumption of animal source foods. You need more starchy staples, more pulses, um, more vegetables uh, and, and fruits. So um, it's a very sad story here. Um, in many respects, that as incomes rise above the middle income level, um, that diets become um, more unbalanced and lower quality than they are um, at uh, lower income levels, except for the very low uh, income levels. So, um, uh, yeah, if we look at the index in a different way, if we look at um, which foods are consumed to an excessive degree, uh, if we look at the top part there, we see very poor people consume too much of starchy staples, um, and then richer people consume too much of oils and fats. If you look at the part above the line there, above zero, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and everybody pretty much consumes too much sugar, um, but there's not a lot of change uh, in that as a share of the calories from sugar as a share. Of, of total diet. So this gives us, um, uh, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned there, Bennett's law 
the, the consumption of starchy staples um, shrinks uh, rapidly. And so we see that, that brown part of the, of the bar, excessive consumption of starchy staples, which is a, an unfortunate feature of the diets of very poor people. That part disappears and what becomes excessive is consumption of animal source foods and oils and fats. So this gives us um, a measure um, of uh, the, the diet, so a, a, a basis for evaluating the impacts of income changes on the diet. So at low incomes, the index is around 0.75. It rises through the World Bank's low and middle income groups to peak at about 8.87 in the upper middle income group. Um, that says diets diversify away from starchy stables. Then it declines as incomes rise and oils and fats and animal source foods exceed their targets. So the richest have lower quality diets than the poorest at around 0.72 in terms of uh, meeting the dietary guidelines that are given to us by nutritionists. The revealed preference is not a good indicator of dietary quality. That's a, a very different situation from the economist normal model, the normal assumption that as income dries, people will choose things that give them more satisfaction. Now, these diets rich in animal source foods may give us more direct satisfaction, but they certainly uh, are excessive in terms of health uh, outcomes. So how do we want to improve nutritional outcomes? One approach is to focus on income growth, higher incomes, increase the options. Um, but <clears throat> as we've seen, this is the case in lower income levels, doesn't appear to be the case for higher income countries. There's another approach, is a set of interventions that work by con changing consumer prices, taxes and tariffs on unhealthy foods, investing in productivity growth to lower the cost of healthy foods, lower costs of preparing healthy foods. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, non-animal source food diets that involve nuts, pulses and nuts, take a long time to prepare. Uh, another approach is changing the properties of food, biofortification, um, the incorporation of uh, central you know, trace element in foods, that's an important step um, that uh, was an important focus of, of IFPRI's work. Um, and then education, moral suasion. I think there are important lessons here um, from uh, the campaigns against excessive tobacco consumption that have had a big impact, just by pointing out the adverse health impact. The role of price-based measures um, price elasticities of demand are larger at lower income levels. Poorer people must adjust their consumption in response to price changes. So because pe poorer people are spending more of their income on food, the income effects of higher prices are larger. So you raise the price of a food for poor people, um, they want to switch away from it, and their income falls uh, as a consequence of that rise in price. And so... Um, you get a double-edged uh, reduction in consumption. So one approach we're using here, we use a tin bot called Jan Tinbergen's approach. What price changes do we need to hit nutritional targets? We've got six targets and six instruments. Good pulses and nuts are almost completely unresponsive to price changes. So we only end up with five price changes, prices that we can, with which we can, we can work. So what we want to do, um, we're interested, for the economists in the audience, we're interested in the changes in consumption uh, as a consequence of changes in price. And this might be, say, from a consumption tax. Um, and there's an elasticity, a matrix of elasticities of demand. As we change prices, we change consumption. If we want to change consumption in a particular way, then... Um, and that's our goal. We, I've removed that to the right-hand side of the equation. We need to invert the matrix of elasticities. That tells us then what changes in price we need to make to get a desired change uh, in consumption. Now, if we look at the 10th percentile of world income, um, <clears throat> around $1,000 in, in uh, today's terms, um, what we find is that these elasticities of food demand are actually price elasticities um, are actually reasonably substantial. Except for starchy staples, they tend not to adjust 
consumption adjusts not very much uh, in that case. But if we look at vegetables and fruits, point three, uh, a change in price will have an impact there. Change in oil, oil, uh, oil, oils and fats prices has an impact on consumption. And then with meat, seafood, dairy, eggs, those price impacts uh, are quite large by, in terms of the price elasticities of food demand. The average price elasticity is 0.35. We'll come back uh, to that. So because of the project focus, we just consider the declines in prices associated with a 10% move towards the target. We look at the 10th percentile of the income distribution. Um, those price changes that we would need to get that increase, that change in 10% um, move towards the target, actually give us a big improvement in the healthy diet basket index. So what this suggests is that changes in prices um, can materially improve diets in poorer countries. The elasticities are high enough to matter. Animal source foods and vegetables and fruit are heavily underconsumed, and they're the prices, products with the highest price um, elasticities. So price interventions, it looks as though we can get substantial improvements by lowering the cost of the foods that are underconsumed in poor countries. So that's the, the good news. Um, when we move to the median level of world income, about $13,000 a day, what we find is the elasticities of price demand, the, the average own price elasticity has fallen from 0.36 to 0.19. It's roughly half. It's much harder to get changes in consumption by changing, uh, changing prices. And if we move to um, the 80th percentile, an income level of around 37,000 US dollars in 2022, the average price elasticity is down to minus 0.023. Essentially, you can't do anything uh, of, of, of importance by changing prices. You've got to look to other policy instruments if you're to change consumption patterns in a way that m moves consumers towards healthy diets. So the declining effect of price-based policies, um, those own price elasticities at the 80th percentile, only 6% of their value at the 10th percentile. The own price elasticities that matter for these groups are starchy staples and vegetables and fruits. Rich people are consuming too little starchy staples um, and too little vegetables and fruits. But these elasticities of demand are so small that you can't expect to get much improvement in diets by lowering the prices, say, of vegetables and fruits. Um, now, it's possible that these elasticities of demand, and this is something we're going to explore, are actually a little bit in the higher income levels are too low. So we'll have another look at that. Um, but I think our tentative conclusion is that improving diets at higher income levels is going to need to rely more heavily on policy instruments other than those operating through prices. So I think we're coming up to about the time where I'm meant to finish the, the presentation. Um, what do we do in this paper? <clears throat> well, we develop an index of diet quality to examine the responsiveness <coughs> of diet quality <coughs> to, <coughs> to income growth and price changes. That, I think, is probably... Um, a, 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 an important element of this work is developing a methodology that we can use to address this question. To do, we then use the Maydad's demand system of Guel and Gwimba to examine the impacts of income growth and price changes on diet. And what we find when we do that, and it's a little surprising to me as an economist, is that income growth seems to improve diet quality up to today's upper middle income level, the, the sort of income level that uh, we see in China today. Um, uh, but the diet quality then deteriorates as consumers um, um, express their sort of in, innate preference for too much animal source foods and too much anim uh, oils uh, and fats, uh, and 
dietary quality ends up quite far from recommended diets uh, in the higher income uh, countries, higher income levels. Reducing prices of healthy foods, such as dairy products, vegetables and fruit, can improve diet quality for people at today's 10th percentile income level, but seems unlikely to be effective at middle and higher income levels. The price elasticities are so much lower um, than at, high, at low income levels, and especially they're lower for foods like pulses that are under-consumed um, at both high and low income levels. And from the analysis that we have available, it appears that the consumption of, of nuts and pulses is actually almost completely unresponsive uh, to prices um, at any income level. So that's a, that's a challenge for policy makers seeking to improve nutrition. So this is very early stage work. Thank you very much for listening. And I do hope that you have lots of questions and comments that we can use to improve the quality of the work as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Wu, for your presentation, uh, uh, summarizing the, uh, the latest uh, findings uh, of, of, the, of the research. Uh, very interesting. We received uh, several uh, questions uh, from the audience in advance, but let me, let me actually raise one question uh, before going into the questions that we received from the viewers. Uh, you talked about uh, various uh, 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 tools uh, for improving the uh, nutritional outcomes uh, during the, uh, in the middle of the, your, your presentation. Uh, what do you think about uh, approaches to the private sector, who actually is the main food producer, actually? And you mentioned about uh, uh, potential taxes and tariffs on unhealthy food, uh, you know, etc. But uh, uh, while uh, you know uh, working with the uh, uh, government and countries, yeah. uh, what, we, what, we sh what, what should we do uh, uh, to work together with the private sector to improve the situation? Oh, no, I think that's a that's a great question, um, uh, Koichi, um, and uh, it's certainly got to be done in conjunction with the private sector. I think one of the challenges for the private sector is that we have a lot of research done to find what foods are going to be attractive to consumers. And if you have a laboratory and you do uh, careful taste tests, what people tell you is, oh, they love that sweet um, uh, breakfast cereal. Or, or uh, they love that juicy uh, 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 steak. Um, and <clears throat> uh, the private sector has a tendency, food manufacturers have a tendency to produce what the, what the customer wants. Um, and normally that's a good thing. Uh, but in the case of diet quality and health impacts of food choices, um, we see that at least in the richer countries, that consumers' own preferences, which come to us from uh, the cave era when, when uh, you know, the occasional bit of animal-sourced food from hunting uh, was, um, you know, very much, very much valued. Um, now, that said, I think the private sector is actually not interested in killing its customers. So um, they are also, once we're aware of the nature of the problem, once they're actually also interested in improving diets in ways that will not have the nutritional, adverse nutritional consequences that we're seeing. Um, so I think it's very important for uh, those, everyone interested in nutrition uh, to be working with the private sector. But also be aware that the private sector, you know, looking to accommodate people's tastes and preferences um, uh, is actually, and, and people's tastes and preferences themselves are leading to quite uh, severely adverse dietary implications. <laughs> so we, we need to think more. I mean, just one very important thing is to just highlight to people, you know, the adverse impact of a lot of those, uh, of our food choices. Um, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, at the, at the, at the lower income levels, there's a lot more opportunity to improve diets by lowering the cost of healthy foods. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, we received uh, several questions uh, from the uh, uh, anonymous participant. Uh, thank you very much for sending your question, as always. Uh, let me read uh, some of those questions that we received from you. Do you uh, conduct analysis that incorporate cross elasticity uh, and supply elasticity? Uh, that's one question. The other question, how do you analyze the relationship on food access with changes in prices of non-food items such as energy or digital technology? So that's the uh, second question, uh, if you have any uh, comments. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, I'm a little, uh, can I just have a, you know, I think you wrote them down in a way that's very, very handy, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, well, the, the cross-price elasticities, thank you for that question. Inside that Tinbergen analysis, we're not just considering the own price impacts. We do use the cross-price impacts as well. So that's um, that technique where Tinbergen sets out a set of goals and then works out what changes in prices you need to achieve those goals takes into account not just the own price effects, but also the cross price effects. So instead of just um, dividing the elastic, uh, you know, taking the inverse of the elasticity, you take the inverse of the entire um, <clears throat> matrix of demand elasticity. So the, de the supply elasticities are implicit uh, in that if we can raise the productivity of healthy foods, especially say, fruits, vegetables, uh, pulses, nuts, those increases in uh, productivity are going to drive down the price. In other work, what we do is we look at uh, a global computable general equilibrium model. We use that to, to work out what's the impact of that productivity on prices and, and the, the, con the combined impact of that productivity, which raises the incomes of poor farmers, this is in work where we're looking at the, uh, the impact of the, the CGIAR system. We take into account that increase in productivity on the incomes of farmers and then the, the change in prices uh, on the incomes, uh, both of uh, producers and of consumers. And we then track uh, the impacts of that on poverty uh, and nutritional consequences. So we do take into account um, those uh, things. Um, prices of non-food items such as energy or digital technology, um, the matrix of food demand that we get from the Guel and Gwimba has, a, has the uh, own and cross-price effects with other commodities. We can analyze the impacts of changes in energy prices or other non-food prices in this analysis, we focus just on on food prices, but we certainly we certainly can can do that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, great. Okay, thank you. And one more question from the same uh, participant: uh, If one selects a healthier diet, it can be said that one would become vulnerable because of the limited time lengths and shortage of available food options and the characteristics and social background of the food options. Therefore, healthy diet uh, may uh, become uh, rather expensive compared to regular available food. How will you put into a mixed nature of the consumer demand into uh, your calculation analysis? No, no, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. When you, when you look at the poorest people, um, certainly that's a huge problem. Why do poor people tend to use, eat diets that are heavily concentrated in staple foods it's because their incomes are so low. They can't afford to change to a diet that includes an adequate level of animal source foods um, or adequate levels of fruits and vegetables uh, just to maintain um, uh, their bodily function. They need to get enough, that's the, uh, enough energy. And the cheapest way to get energy is from starchy staples. So that's a 
huge problem for very poor people, for poor people, people not just very poor people, people up to the lower middle income level uh, of, of World Bank. So bank standards. Um, so for them, getting a healthy diet requires more income uh, and they need to, a more diversified diet with foods which are much more expensive per unit of calories. And, and interestingly, those foods tend to be more expensive in poor countries than they are in rich countries. And that's a very puzzling thing. Animal source foods, uh, this is work done by Harold Alderman and Derek Hetty, uh, turn out to be more expensive in uh, the poorer countries than they are in rich countries. In rich countries, I think you have a well-developed distribution system for products like meat, uh, milk rather, um, in poor countries, much much less so. So your question is exactly right for, for poorer people. For people um, in the upper middle and, and above, in levels of income, moving to a healthy diet, healthier diet, would actually lower the cost of food because you'd be replacing a lot of animal source foods um, with uh, more vegetables, uh, more, more uh, nuts and uh, pulses, um, and more starchy staples because starchy staples tend to end up being under-consumed by rich people. So your, your, your instinct is totally correct for poor people um, and uh, but the situation for richer people, richer people will be less vulnerable if they if they eat something nearer uh, the diets recommended by nutritionists. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, you responded to the question that we received from our viewers in advance. Uh, so we we'll, uh, before wrapping up uh, this seminar, uh, if you have any final words uh, to our viewers, then we'll wrap up the seminar. Um, no, the, nothing, nothing major, I guess. For me, this is a, a new um, area. It's an exciting uh, area. Many of the results are something of a surprise to me. I find it uh, very exciting that with the work um, Anna Hepworth uh, and others that we have now a, a way of representing a healthy diet based on the work of nutritionists and nationally recommended dietary standards. Uh, and that, that then gives us the ability to see what sort of policy combination. We're going to need multiple policy interventions to achieve the, the dietary, recommended dietary approaches, recommended diets, um, because we, we're trying to target at least half a dozen goals, and as Jan Tinbergen pointed out to us um, in, the, in nearly 100 years ago, um, if you've got multiple goals, you need multiple instruments. So we're going to need to change our thinking uh, quite a lot. I think we can, we can do a lot for poorer people in terms with standard sort of instruments like lowering the cost of nutritious food um, for people at higher income levels, it's uh, perhaps even more challenging than it is to help guide people to diets that not only are satisfying, but also uh, better for long-term health. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We had a pleasure of having uh, Will Martin, who is a senior research fellow at the IFPRI International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, during his very short visit uh, to Tokyo, we were able to grab him uh, to be able to speak to our seminar. Uh, this seminar was made possible uh, with a special support from the Economic Research Institute for Northeast Asia, ERINA. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, colleagues at ERINA uh, making this uh, seminar possible. Will, thank you. Uh, 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 please uh, enjoy the rest of your stay in Tokyo. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Koichi. Super. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we are going to have two seminars next week. Uh, let me make a small an announcement. One is the uh, Thursday morning on December 8th from 8 a.m. in Tokyo time. We are going to feature the latest edition of the uh, Poverty and Shared Prosperity 2022 edition. Uh, this is going to be a regular morning seminar uh, broadcasted by uh, YouTube. So that's one. The other one is we are going to have 
Dorote Verna, who is a lead economist uh, in agriculture area uh, for Africa, visiting Tokyo next week. We are going to have her uh, in person uh, and also uh, in a hybrid manner, uh, featuring uh, her latest report on insect farming uh, as a pot uh, potential uh, source for the uh, protein uh, for the Africa. So this is going to be at 12 p.m. Uh, next week, Thursday, uh, December 8th. So please find the latest information on our website, uh, and then uh, please uh, join us uh, at uh, those seminars. With that, have a good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you.